this video, we're going to summarize and connect all of the pathways and processes we've discussed across the metabolism lectures. We're going to break down the big picture by connecting the three main sources of fuel and the various fates they can take in the liver. We're going to take a look at anabolic reactions and catabolic reactions. So let's get started. So we have three sources of organic fuels glucose from carbohydrates, fatty acids from fats, and amino acids from proteins. So hepatocytes, the liver, is responsible for breaking down these complex macromolecules into simple end products in order to release energy. So after we consume these nutrients, sugars, amino acids, and triacylglycerols, they are absorbed by the epithelial cells of the intestine, then into the capillaries, into the blood, and to the liver. The role of hepatocyte then is to break down these nutrients so we can extract energy and extract precursors that other tissues need. So the liver is very flexible. And so what we're going to break down in this lecture is the various possible pathways of these simple end products, focusing on sugars, amino acids, and lipids. So now let's subtract complexity by starting with sugars or glucose. Okay, so glucose enters hepatocytes via a glucose transporter called GLUT2, and it's going to be phosphorylated by hexokinase 4 or glucokinase, forming glucose 6-phosphate. So we've added that phosphate group onto that 6-carbon. And the reason why we've phosphorylated glucose is so that it can't leave the cell because the membrane doesn't have a transporter for phosphorylated sugars. And there are other hexokinase isozymes. So what isozymes are, they are different proteins that catalyze the same reaction, so multiple forms of an enzyme. Now, glucokinase has a higher Km for glucose, and it's not affected by its product glucose 6-phosphate, which means it won't inhibit the phosphorylation of glucose when glucose concentration is high, unlike other hexokinase. And we talked about this in the regulation of glycolysis. We talked about the differences between the different hexokinases. Now, glucose 6-phosphate is a popular guy. He plays an important role in metabolism, having various possible fates depending on the cell's metabolic requirements. So let's break down the possible metabolic pathways for glucose 6-phosphate. Well, glucokinase phosphorylated glucose so it can't leave the cell. Glucose 6-phosphatase, which is an enzyme found only in the liver, can dephosphorylate glucose 6-phosphate. So removing that phosphate group from that 6-carbon, so we're going to be hydrolyzing glucose 6-phosphate to yield free glucose. Glucose can then be transported to the blood to maintain blood glucose levels. It's crucial that the cell has sufficient levels of glucose to extract energy for the brain and other extrahepatic tissues. So that's the first pathway. The second pathway is if there is excess energy, excess glucose, glucose 6-phosphate can be converted to liver glycogen, polymer of glucose, and this pathway is called glycogenesis. The third pathway is glycolysis, so the oxidation of glucose to produce two molecules of pyruvate. The pyruvate can then be oxidized to acetyl-CoA by the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. And from acetyl-CoA, acetyl-CoA can enter the citric acid cycle to yield energy and form ATP molecules. The electrons generated in the cycle is transferred to the electron transport chain to drive ATP synthesis, a process known as oxidative phosphorylation. Now, acetyl-CoA can also be used as the starting material for fatty acid synthesis and can also lead to the formation of triacylglycerols for storage and phospholipids. These lipids are transported out of the liver and to other tissues. Another pathway for glucose 6-phosphate is the pentose phosphate pathway, producing NADPH. And if we refer back to the fatty acid synthesis lecture, this is a crucial electron donor. And the product, ribose 5-phosphate, is a precursor for nucleotide synthesis. So these are the different pathways glucose 6-phosphate can take depending on the organism's metabolic requirements. 
The enzymes involved in these pathways are tightly regulated allosterically and hormonally, and that is carbohydrate metabolism. Now, before we move on to amino acids, let's highlight catabolic and anabolic pathways and quickly summarize all the pathways involved in carbohydrate metabolism. It's beautiful the way they connect. Now, recall that there are two types of metabolism. We have catabolism, which is the breakdown of complex macromolecules into simple and smaller molecules, releasing energy. So in carbohydrate catabolism, this includes glycolysis, so the oxidation of glucose to produce two molecules of pyruvate, pyruvate dehydrogenase reaction, converting pyruvate to acetyl-CoA, we have lactic acid fermentation, so taking glucose and converting it to lactate, and this occurs anaerobically. The pentose phosphate pathway and glycogenolysis, or the breakdown of glycogen to yield free glucose molecules. So that's carbohydrate catabolism. Let's move on to carbohydrate anabolism. This includes gluconeogenesis, so this is where we're synthesizing glucose from non-carbohydrate sources. It includes glycogen synthesis or glycogenesis. And another pathway you can include here is the glucose alanine cycle. So converting glucose to pyruvate and then to alanine, which is transported to the liver to form glucose again via gluconeogenesis. So that's glucose. Let's now move on to amino acids and break down all of the pathways that is involved with amino acids. Amino acids are derived from dietary proteins and most amino acids are metabolized in the liver. However, amino acids can't be stored, so we need to supply amino acids for protein synthesis. And we can't synthesize all of the amino acids ourselves. There are two types of amino acids. We have essential and non-essential. So amino acids are precursors for protein synthesis, liver proteins, and plasma proteins. Amino acids can also be used by other tissues to synthesize proteins, so it's going to travel in the blood to other organs. Amino acids are broken down by removing the amino group, a process called transamination, and it's separated from its carbon skeleton. So it can be broken down to pyruvate and other citric acid cycle intermediates, yielding ammonia. The ammonia that was released is converted to urea via the urea cycle, and that's because ammonia is toxic, so the brain can get damaged and it can cause cognitive impairment. So ammonia is converted to urea, which is a non-toxic and water-soluble that is exported to the kidneys for excretion. And if we go back to pyruvate here, pyruvate can be used to form glucose and glycogen via gluconeogenesis. And this glucose is transported to the blood to replenish blood glucose levels. And pyruvate can be oxidized to acetyl-CoA by the pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. And the acetyl-CoA we form here can enter the citric acid cycle and oxidative phosphorylation so that we can yield energy. So it's going to be similar to the pathways of sugar. So acetyl-CoA can also serve as a precursor for fatty acids and be converted to lipids for storage. The citric acid cycle intermediates here can enter gluconeogenesis to yield glucose. And amino acids from muscle can be transported to hepatocytes such as alanine via the transamination process. Now in the liver, alanine is deaminated, producing pyruvate and ammonia, so referring back to the glucose alanine cycle. And the last pathway, amino acids are precursors in the synthesis of nucleotides and hormones. Wow, okay, that is a lot of pathways that are connected when you zoom out and look at the bigger picture. So let's summarize amino acid metabolisms and the pathways involved. So we have amino acid breakdown. So taking the amino acids and producing pyruvate, acetyl-CoA, and the citric acid cycle intermediates. We have the urea cycle, so the ammonia is released from amino acid degradation and is converted to urea for excretion, and that's because ammonia is toxic. We have the glucose alanine cycle and also hormone and nucleotide synthesis. So that is amino acid metabolism. Let's now move on to lipids, taking a look at fatty acid metabolism. 
Now, remember the structure of a simple lipid? We have three fatty acid chains bound to glycerol, also called triacylglycerol, and they are an ideal energy storage because lipids are neutral, which means they have no ionizable groups, they are insoluble in water and inert in storage. So, to oxidize fatty acids, they're first released from storage. And these fatty acids have several pathways they can enter. When there's excess energy, fatty acids can be converted back to lipids for storage. Fatty acids can be converted to phospholipids or be transported to the heart and skeletal muscle to use as fuel. It's going to be bound to serum albumin, which is a plasma protein that carry fatty acids. It's a beautiful boat. Or when the organism requires energy, fatty acids can be activated and undergo beta oxidation to yield acetyl-CoA and NADH. Then the acetyl-CoA we've produced is oxidized via the citric acid cycle and oxidative phosphorylation so that we can yield energy. We can produce ATP. Now, when there's no glucose available, the liver has excess acetyl-CoA. So the excess acetyl-CoA can be converted to ketone bodies. So ketone bodies is our alternate energy source when glucose is not available. And it's an alternate energy source of extrahepatic tissues in the brain because fatty acids can't cross the blood-brain barrier. So when glucose is not available, the acetyl-CoA we've derived from fatty acid oxidation is turned into ketone bodies to provide energy for the brain, skeletal muscle, and heart muscle. Now going back to acetyl-CoA, it can also be used for cholesterol synthesis, and cholesterol is a precursor for steroid hormones. So those are the pathways of lipid metabolism. Before we end this lecture, let's quickly summarize lipid metabolism and the pathways involved. So fatty acids can undergo beta oxidation, yielding acetyl-CoA. It can undergo fatty acid synthesis, so acetyl-CoA back to fatty acids. Can undergo triacylglycerol synthesis, ketone body formation, ketone bodies oxidation. So when glucose is not available and we need an alternate energy source because fatty acids can't cross the blood-brain barrier, so we need to produce energy for the brain and other extrahepatic tissues. And we also have phospholipid synthesis. Now taking a look at all these pathways and processes, the liver plays a significant role in processing and distributing nutrients for itself and other extrahepatic tissues and organs. It's metabolically flexible, adapting to the organism's metabolic needs, and that is absolutely beautiful. <laughs> so that is liver metabolism. In this lecture, we summarized and connected all of the pathways that are involved in carbohydrate metabolism, amino acid metabolism, and lipid metabolism, taking a look at all the various processes and fates they can take in the liver. It's absolutely beautiful what the liver can do and how it can process and distribute nutrients for itself and other extrahepatic tissues. Thank you for watching this video. Make sure you subscribe to EKG Science so you don't miss a single lecture. And remember, subtract complexity and slow down. To study the next lecture, simply click the next video or you can view the entire metabolism playlist. Hey, stop procrastinating!